gospel lesson for this morning comes from Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus told his disciples, If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm usually loath to make an announcement after the announcements have ended, but I forgot one important one. Easter flower orders are due tomorrow or today. If you want to, tomorrow, we've got to be there at 10 o'clock with your form for Kara because she has to call them in tomorrow. I'm trying to stretch this out because I don't think I'm going to make it, ladies, so don't yell during the sermon because spring begins at 11.33 this morning. These girls up here cannot wait for spring, so they were going to yell when it was time, but don't yell during the sermon. I might fall over. If you've read my pastor's page, which some people sometimes do in the newsletter, most of you don't, I'm sure, because I don't always get to it myself. But I talked about being in California on a Sabbath rest in 1999 and meeting who would become later Bishop William Willimon, who is a hoot and a half. He is funny. He is great. He's one of the best preachers I've ever heard. And I took a class with him in preaching on Lent and Easter, but I only went for the Easter part because I had enough Lent that year. He told this story there, and it has since appeared in several blogs that he's written, and I've mentioned it before, but I want to read you a little piece of it. This is from the time before he was a bishop. He was the dean of the chapel at Duke University, Duke Divinity School. Then before that, he was a, just a pastor like the rest of us, and this is from his days of pastoral ministry. The latest ruckus to hit the house of God here at 435 Summit Drive was precipitated, as was the previous one, by the pastor. All I did was to suggest to an amateur woodcarver in the congregation it would be nice if he turned his talents toward the carving of a processional cross for our church. I had in mind something simple, modern and clean, something congruent with Northside Church's minimalist architecture, something light enough for a white-robed adolescent to carry on Sundays. We got the first Sunday of Lent was a dramatic sort of cross, heavy, complete with a realistic bleeding corpus, a hanging crucified Christ, blood and everything. Some managed to like it because a nice person had made it. Some liked it because they appreciated the intricate carving. Many were upset because it was, quote, unquote, more Catholic than Methodist, quote, unquote, gory and depressing, or it didn't, quote, unquote, go with our colors. What is a modern, progressive, slightly liberal, well-budgeted Methodist church to do with a bloody cross these days? And he goes on to say, a few Lenten seasons ago, my friend Ed Covert put up three crosses draped in black on the front lawn of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church and received a dozen calls complaining that the crosses made the neighborhood look bad. Christ or humanity suffering, it seems, is something unpleasant that happens to other people, more annoying than ennobling, something to be eradicated by the latest wonder drug or meditative technique. Well, when we started our new Acolyte Corps, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had a professional cross? And I, this story came to mind. Now, we do have a very talented woodcarver. I think Beth is probably still out there. But have you ever been in a church with a processional cross? One of the Acolytes carries it down and puts it up. I remember when he told this story, he said that he had a 14-year-old boy and he was buckling under the weight of this crucifix. And I know some people don't like a crucifix, and I've heard more than once it's too Catholic. Now, John keeps asking me if I found the one that usually hangs over my bedroom door or not yet. It's still in a box somewhere in my garage or somewhere since my move. Now, let me tell you, it gave my Baptist husband pause when we got married. He moved into the parsonage, and he looked up and said, wow. But that wasn't the worst response I had to the, cru the crucifix hanging over my bedroom door. The worst was, what is that thing? I said, that's our Lord and Savior. To which the person who had made that comment said, I worship a risen Lord. I said, so do I, but my risen Lord died for my sake on a cross. I can never forget that. 
I got it as a gift after a wedding I had done when I served in deaf ministry. I served a very poor congregation. Mark and Jean's daughter served the same congregation I served later. We did everything we do here except in sign language. I had done a wedding for a young couple who had very little money. They had given me a box at the end of the wedding instead of giving me a check or something like that. I never charge anybody for weddings. But they gave me a box, and it was a box that was sealed shut, and I thought it was what was on the front of the box, which was a set of glassware with daisies on it, I remember. Amber glasses with daisies. And I thought, okay. Put them in my office, never looked at them. So I got a TTY call in the days where people would type on their machine, and it would come up one letter at a time on your machine. It took a long time to have a little conversation in those days with deaf folks. But what was written there was, did you like the gift? I said, yes, I can always use more glasses, thinking I've got to take those home. And he laughed. He said, you didn't look in the box, did you? Looked in the box, and it was a crucifix from a Catholic gift shop. And a lot of churches will have gift shops. Big Catholic churches will have gift shops. The cheapest thing you could ever imagine is a little piece of metal on a wooden cross humbled me at that moment because I know they had no money and they went out and they paid probably $2.95 for this to show me their appreciation. Since that day, it has hung over my bedroom door. Let me tell you why it hangs over my bedroom door. I've said this before in sermons, especially the one where I told you about my call back a couple years ago, and some of you were here for that one, but I know you don't tend to remember sermons. That's okay, too. But when I went into the ministry... At 25 years old, I'd spent three years trying to talk myself out of it. Three years trying to live myself out of it, trying to show God that I was not fit in any way, shape, or form to be a pastor in the church. Because at 22, I became the chair of the Texas Charge Pastor Parish Relations Committee. Not because I was particularly well equipped for that job, but because nobody else would take it. And we had a really bad situation that happened with the pastor and the congregation. I had to be the intermediary between the congregation and the district superintendent. It was an awful time of life. They also sent me to annual conference because no one wanted to go. The first year I went to the ordination service and I heard the bishop at the end of the service say, among us are men and women. I was like, women? Women, are you kidding me? Who are called to the life and work of pastors in the church, elders in the church in those days. And I felt myself saying, well, I think he's talking to me, but I didn't go until the year that we had conference in Washington, D.C. We had our meetings during the day at the Washington Hebrew Congregation, and that year we spent all kinds of money because ordination that year was in the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception at Catholic University. If you've ever been there, it's a huge cathedral. We were sitting there, and at the end of the service, Bishop Wirtz again said, among us are men and women. I was thinking, women? Women, really? Now, women have been ordained since two years before I was born in 19... <laughs> but um, I had never met an ordained Methodist woman before. And he said, if Christ is calling you, come forward. And I made the mistake of looking up. Because hanging in that congregation, leaning out over the congregation, is Jesus on the cross, and he looked right at me, and he said, yes, I mean you. Other people had said, not you. You're not right. You're not like a pastor. You're too outspoken, you're too this, you're too that, you're too the other, you're too female to be a pastor. But Jesus said, yes, you. So the crucifix holds a very special place in my heart. But you have to understand what a cross meant 2,000 years ago. In the first century, a decent person would not utter the word cross. It was reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. It was a horrible way to die. It took days. And we always see paintings of Jesus hung high in the air, but mostly people were along the side of the road just a few feet off the ground so they could cry out to help, for help from the people passing by. A decent person wouldn't say cross, and here we have the cross here. First, we read a little bit of this story from another version that I read in Matthew today. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples. What was the time before that when Jesus said to them, what are people saying about me and what did they say? Let's test your memory said the same thing here they said a couple weeks ago. Some say you're who? John the Baptist. Others say maybe you're Elijah. Ah, very good. Who do you say that I am? And what did they say to him? You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Now Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, not the one we read a few weeks ago, says, I can build a church on that. That's a rock. That's something solid. That's foundational. I can build my church on that. Peter must have been feeling pretty good because Peter got so many things wrong 
he finally gets one right, he's like, yes, yes, yes. And then Jesus says to them, now that you know who I am, let me go through what's going to happen. He must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. Peter goes from the rock to the basement then, doesn't he? Get behind me who? Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Poor Peter. And he told his disciples then, if you want to become my follower, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross. Because criminals had to carry their own cross to their own execution in a cruel twist of fate. Now, we also read from Paul this morning from the great hymn to the Philippian church. What does that say? It talks about if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the spirit, any compassion or sympathy, make my joy complete, says Paul to those who are listening. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. What does that mean? That means how you bear your cross in the world. And the great hymn, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You don't know what a slap in the face that was to the listeners, to those who were gathered to worship, to hear that word cross. Because we have crosses everywhere, don't we? Cross on our church, cross everywhere you look, there's a cross. But there's never anybody harder on a Christian than another Christian. If we have a crucifix, that's too Catholic. We don't want to be too Catholic, do we? And then there are the churches who don't use crosses at all, who say, if Jesus had died on the electric chair, would you have that hanging in your church and worship it? We don't worship the cross. We worship the one who gave his life on the cross and who calls us to pick up ours and walk. Now, you notice he didn't say, I'm going to put one on you. Here, lean down, does he? This is a volunteer army, boys and girls. We are all called to pick it up and walk with it. Now, we get some trifling answers sometimes. People will say, my curly cr hair is my cross to bear. A woman said that to me once in church. I had to bite my tongue and remember not to be judgmental when I said that's not what Jesus is talking about. It's not those little things in life that we have to put up with. It's not petty annoyances. It's living the life that God calls us to live, as Jesus said, through the Apostle Paul, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, Paul writes, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Hard to do, isn't it? We have to pick up a cross and walk with it. That means we have to follow the way of God. But we don't have to bear a cross for the entire world, for its sin, for its brokenness. He did that for our sake, but he calls us to walk in his way, knowing that he walks with us every step that we go. We go with Christ. I said this year I'd had about enough land already because it's been two years and almost a week since we stopped worshiping together the way we had for years and years and years. I was just getting to know everybody, and now I don't even see people's faces sometimes because they're masked. We've lost so many people through this pandemic that I didn't get to see. I didn't get to pray with people before surgery in hospital. There's so many things about my job that are different and so many things about all our lives that are different. Perhaps this has been a cross that we have all had to bear together until we get to the point where we feel safe again being unmasked and going back to the way things were. We have to go back to, not the way things were, but we have to go back to proclaiming Christ above all and carrying our cross. We have to do it in a new way. We have people who need to be reached with the love and the grace, the mercy and the peace of Christ. We have people who have had broken hearts through this pandemic. We have people who don't know the love of a Savior, people who don't know forgiveness, who don't know that there is a fresh start for them. People who are afraid to walk in the door here because they might be judged just as they judged that carved image of our Lord on the cross in a Christian church on a Sunday morning. It's 1133. <laughs> Happy spring.
Thank you for whispering that to me. At the spring, everybody, it's spring. Let's, let's have a chair for spring. <laughs> spring always comes, just like Easter. It always comes. Easter's always with us. It's one of those great Greek verb tenses where something happened in the past and continues to happen for all eternity. That's what resurrection does. Raises us up again and again and again. But please don't skip what happens on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Don't go from Hosanna to Hallelujah without looking at the cost of our salvation. Jesus gave himself willingly for our sake so that we might live through him forever. So pick up your cross and follow him. He's not going to take you to Golgotha. You're not going to suffer for the sins of the world. It might be a little heavy sometimes because sometimes what does the cross feel like? feels like saying something when you would rather remain silent. Um, most of you knew my father when he was here. And he would say to me after sermons, stop talking about that. People don't like it. Especially if I talked about race or racism. He'd say, people don't like that. You've got to stop it. Cut it out. I didn't, did I? No. Because we are called to speak the truth in love to one another. I'll never call you all racist. I'm going to invite you to become anti-racist with me. That's what we're talking about here. I don't put up with hearing things that deride and demean other people. And sometimes that gets you in trouble because sometimes it's hard to preach the truth, even when it is the truth and people know it. I have so many young pastors that I've mentored through the years, and they all say to me, it's really hard, isn't it? And I said, sometimes it is. Because nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Nobody wants to hear about this. You go to seminary, everybody, all they do is talk about Jesus all day long. You, know, you eat dinner, you talk about Jesus at the table. You eat breakfast, you talk about Jesus at the table. You get out into the church, and they want to fight about the color of the carpet and the drapes and stuff like that. And you're like, wow. But we also are here to talk about the power of Christ at work in and through us, through this congregation. We're going to have a passionate Easter this year. We're going to look at what it is that God is calling each of us to do, and we're going to do it to the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to pick up our cross. We're going to walk. We're going to not just walk. We're going to run. We're not just going to run. We're going to sing while we go along our way because Christ has done so much for us. We can be of the same heart, even when we disagree. We can be of the same mind. Even when we disagree on issues of doctrine and things like that, we can still be of the same mind, meaning that we put God first. We love others as God loves us. We make disciples for Jesus Christ. We have a new mission statement, folks, and we're going we're gonna to live it out in the weeks to come. So don't worry about picking up your cross. Jesus isn't going to put it on your shoulder. He's going to let you voluntarily say, yes, Lord, let me walk with you. And trust me, you will get to Easter. You will get beyond Easter. You will get to spring. Amen? Amen.